a couple of days ago, Jordan Peterson put out his first film in quite a while, talking about his recent struggles with benzodiazepines. I think this is a really, really important story, uh, Jordan Peterson being the most high profile case, but it's affected millions and millions of people. And it's actually something I've looked into quite a lot. I was looking into it for a documentary a few years ago, uh, the long-term effects of antipsychiatric medication, including benzodiazepines. And it's also a major case study for many of the issues we've been talking about on Rebel Wisdom. The failures of journalism, and especially something that Eric Weinstein has talked about, the distributed idea suppression complex, or DISC, which is why certain things are talked about in the media and certain things are not talked about. How we get consensus around misinformation. And how it ties in especially to what some people are calling the meta-crisis. How an outdated paradigm, especially in science and medicine, is leading to real-world outcomes and real-world harms for a lot of people. And it also raises interesting questions about Jordan Peterson's philosophy, whether there were blind spots that I hope he continues to explore as he recovers. To unpack this story, I talked to Robert Whittaker, who's an award-winning journalist who's written many books about this subject, including Anatomy of an Epidemic. So I'm going to play quite a lot of clips from him and then other clips of people we've spoken to on the channel and try and unpack this as a story. So first things first, Jordan Peterson's daughter Michaela did an interview with him that she put out on her channel a couple of days ago where he talked about his hist recent history with benzodiazepines and also laid out a pretty stark warning to people. This is part of the reason we're doing this this podcast or video as well to, to let people know these are very widely prescribed drugs and they are not safe to take for more than two weeks or a month at the absolute maximum and if you take them longer than that and you end up addicted you're going to or dependent which means that you'll suffer withdrawal symptoms on their cessation you are going to be one sorry person some people you know have a better time of it when they stop their use than others but enough people have a terrible time so that it's an absolute it's a it's a medically induced epidemic it's a complete bloody catastrophe yeah it's probably worse than the opiate epidemic and that's really saying something so and i don't know if i'm out of it or not you know i mean i'm i have a hard time believing how much better i feel than i did two weeks ago it's it's it doesn't seem plausible he said he was put on benzodiazepines for anxiety which was sparked by a severe allergic reaction to food but then developed a dependency so as I said, I looked into this a while ago for a potential documentary. I read a lot of the books in the area, including Cracked by James Davies, Anatomy of an Epidemic, and Mad in America by Robert Whittaker. And I knew that Robert Whittaker had looked into this for a very long time, so I knew he was the right person to contact. So he's a former investigative journalist with the Boston Globe, and the Boston Globe has got a history of being one of the best investigative papers in the US. Famously, they broke the story of paedophilia in the Catholic Church, which was the subject of the film Spotlight. And Whitaker himself was shortlisted for a Pulitzer Prize. So he's a serious researcher who knows this subject inside out. We're talking now specifically because of the news about Jordan Peterson. And he just put out a video yesterday um, talking about his history with benzodiazepines and warning people not to take them for more than two weeks, that this is that he's very worried about those drugs. Can you talk specifically about benzodiazepines in this context? What, how, how do they work and how does the brain kind of compensate? And why, why are there so many, de de why is it so dangerous to be taking them for, for a length of time? Yeah, uh, the benzo story is really amazing because uh, doctors have known these drugs for a long time, shouldn't be taken long, two or three weeks. So that's not even new knowledge. That became like the official recommendation in 1980. Think of a car has an accelerator, it also has a brake, right? And, and that's how you sort of maintain brain function because you have molecules that can excite things and then you have molecules that can quiet things. Well, the molecule that quiets things, the main molecule is called GABA. And so what happens is that with a, with a GABA neurotransmitter, it, it, it inhibits the firing of the second neuron. It makes it less likely to fire. So it's a quieting thing. So what a benzodiazepine does is it amps up the GABA system. It's like slamming the brake on, 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 on neuronal activity. So that's why, you, 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 you know, that's why, um, you know, your emotions, you know, you feel relaxed or you don't care, your anxiety goes. It's because the, the, the benzo, when you first take it, 
is quieting your, 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 your brain, in essence, and your whole system. And this is why also, if you don't take too many pencils, you'll stop breathing, right? Um, so what, what is, again, so what happens? So this is your braking system, right? So you go on a benzo, uh, and a benzo is amplifying GABA. It, it, it gets into the GABA receptor, so it acts as a GABA substitute. So your brain goes, ah, oh, I'm, I'm doing too much inhibi inhibition. There's too much inhibitory of, of, of my regular functioning. So it starts reducing its uh, GABA receptors and its own production of GABA. So think about this. It's the normal break, right? Now, what you do is with the drug, you press harder on that break, all right? It's like you're putting your foot down. But the break, brain's own braking mechanism then starts becoming less effective, okay? So now go off your benzo, right? What do you got? You've lost your braking system or it's become diminished. So that's why, for example, you hear people coming off, oh, I've got these weird skin sensations and all these things. It's because your neurons are firing like crazy out of control because you have, you have at the very least lessened that natural braking system. Yeah, I, I remember reading your, your work and it just seems so clear that because the brain is a, an adaptive system, it's adapting to the per perturbations that you're having from, the, from not just benzos, but all, all psychiatric drugs. And then, especially if you're taking it for anxiety and your brain is then effectively kind of um, ramping up the, the receptors for anxiety when you're coming off them, you are then super, super sensitized for the very thing that you were trying to uh, dull down in the first place. One thing I'd like to ask you about, because I've seen Jordan uh, Peterson and his daughter talk about that he was prescribed it for a food allergy and then increasingly over, over time developed what he described as a very unusual reaction to, to benzos where they were actually making him more anxious rather than less. And from what I understand from your work, at least, that's not actually that unusual to that you once over time, you start to actually become become more and more sensitized to the very thing that you're trying to block. What would you how would you reflect on that? No, I think you just got it right. <laughs> no, I, I mean, this is part of the tragedy of this whole thing, that you come there for some short relief and short term relief. Uh, but you're setting yourself up if you stay on these very long for, uh, for a difficult process, either the difficult thing of coming off or just as you said, because the brain has changed, um, more everyday anxiety. And there, there is a, a mechanism that explains it. And the mechanism that you're, is, is you're taking away the brain's own braking system. So I'm releasing the whole interview with Robert at the same time as I'm releasing this film. So Robert lays out in detail how benzos are particularly bad, but all psychiatric drugs have serious questions about their long-term use. In Anatomy of an Epidemic, what I did is I just looked at, as a marker of disability, okay? So I looked at the number of people who were ending up on government disability due to mental illness, okay? Now that's the extreme end, right? They can no longer work. Well, in 1987, we had about 1.25 million adults on disability due to mental illness, okay? Then we get this, that's when Prozac comes to market, we get this explosion in the use of drugs. And now today it's around 5 million uh, adults on disability in the United States. And by the way, it's gone up in every country I can find that embrace this story and the use of antidepressants and all. Uh, like in the UK, um, nor, you know, in, in the Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand, you see it over and over again. The second thing is like, what's happening to the kids? So you see with this increasing use of psychiatric drugs, the mental health of kids is, is, is deteriorating. In the United States, something like, well, first of all, just on disability. In 1987, when Prozac came to market, we had 16,000 kids whose families or guardians received a, a payment because the, kid was the child was disabled by mental illness. It's something like seven or 800,000 now. So, you know, that's like, a, what is that, a 40-fold increase, increase? And if you look at kids who end up 
psychiatrized and sort of, um, uh, you know, if they end up on disability, two thirds go on to uh, adult disability when they turn age 18. But the most amazing thing is something like 50% of American students now uh, seek uh, mental health during their four years of college. So I see this disability like the canary in the coal, mi gold, coal mine. In other words, that's, that's a marker of harm done. But all the markers, suicide's gone up like 20 years in a row in the United States. Um, the burden of depression globally has increased dramatically. And I'm not saying it's only due to the drugs, but all the markers of psychiatric distress in developed societies have basically gone up in the last uh, 30 years. So that's on just, um, if we just see this as a, um, a story of a medical failure, okay? If we just look at this through a medical lens, the larger failure is, this is also a story of philosophy because think about what the chemical imbalance story is telling you. It's, it's sort of telling you that these chemicals in your brain control you, right? That you're sort of the, the, the robot to these master chemicals. And it takes away a sense of, of responsibility for oneself, right? Because it's not your responsibility that you're unhappy or whatever. Um, Whereas if you have a different philosophy, and the, and the philosophy is, listen, to suffer is to be human. <laughs> We're going to be anxious. We're going to be depressed sometimes. And even to go a bit mad is not all that unusual, especially if you stop sleeping and stuff. But if we have like an older style of that, first of all, we have a, a you know, if we look at as a philosophy you see in novels and Shakespeare and all, we understand that humans suffer. We also understand that the human mind is not a pleasant place sometimes. It's a difficult place. That becomes your philosophy of understanding what it means to be human. It ain't easy. Growing up ain't easy. So when you suffer, you're depressed, you're grieving, okay, and you're a bit crazy, that's what humans are. So let's be really clear what we're talking about here. Jordan Peterson, along with many, many others, became seriously debilitatingly ill just from following the doctor's advice. What does it say about our society? What does it say about our culture that this is happening to so many people? So partly as Daniel Schmachtenberger laid out in our War on Sensemaking film, we've got an incentive structure that pushes the pharmaceutical companies towards more and more lucrative models. Wherever there is a, a, any misalignment in agency, and there's the ability to share signal for strategic purposes, then you have a basis to have signal that's being shared that isn't just truthful, right? So then we look at, well, where is that happening? And it's fucking everywhere, right? To, to really gross or subtle degrees, pretty much everywhere. And sometimes for dreadful purposes, like, I mean, you got the prosaic purposes, which are basically market type dynamics, which most of the dynamics in the world are market dynamics or at least influenced by market dynamics, right? Market dynamics are fundamentally at least partially, if not mostly rivalrous, meaning my balance sheet can get ahead independent of your balance sheet getting ahead and definitely independent of the commons. As a company, I want to do sense making for you because I want to control your choice making. And to the degree that my fiduciary responsibility is to maximize profitability for me and my shareholders. And so I need to maximize lifetime revenue of my customers multiplied by maximizing the customer base. Addiction is the most profitable thing I can get, right? Where that's never in the best interest of the, of the customer. But we've also got a problem where we can't really trust a lot of the science. The essence of science within the philosophy of science, the essence of it is earnestness of inquiry, right? It's empiricism, but then earnestness of inquiry. Eddington defined science as the earnest endeavor to put into order the facts of experience. And the essence of capitalism is, so you, you can say the essence of science is no bias, right? At least the idea, the spirit of it. We can get into where even the philosophy of science has built in axiomatic bias later. But then the, in capitalism, it is about optimizing for bias, right? Like I actually have, in, an agency that I'm trying to get ahead. I have intention to increase my balance sheet. And so 
if there's capital funding of science, it's going to fund the things that create ROI on that research so we can keep doing more research. That creates both a reason to distort the info and a reason to uh, withhold information that is a source of competitive advantage, a reason to create disinfo. I'd like to, to just move the conversation on to the question of the media and the incentive structures and why is this story not being told? I, I remember reading your book and uh, looking at other books and, and this topic as well and just feeling incredibly um, angry at, at the level of like the level of harm that is caused by this and just the, the level of silence that seems to be um, on, on the part of, of, of the media and on the part of kind of the, the, the institutions. How is that maintained? How is that kind of this, this story maintained? It's a really good question. And uh, it seems hard to imagine that it could have been maintained as well as it has. There's a couple of things. The media doesn't really know the science, right? Because you really have to dig into this. You have to understand how, a science, how, how drugs are tested, and how you can uh, bias uh, trials by design, you know. And there's a lot of different ways. You also have to read the whole studies. You don't just read the abstract. So the first problem is even science reporters generally uh, don't know this literature. Not really. Okay. What they know is what the people they interview tell them, you know, which are academic psychiatrists and all. Um, so why don't we know this story? One is because American psychiatry basically closed ranks in the early 1980s and said, this is the story we're going to tell. And they even had uh, training workshops where they taught psychiatrists to, to tell this story. And the idea was Psychiatry in the 70s was sort of a discipline in disrepute or fearing for its survival. And if they put on the white coat, both literally and metaphorically or figuratively, they could now present themselves to, it's sort of the image of infectious disease doctors. And remember how uh, celebrated infectious disease doctors are because we, you know, we minimized the infectious disease with the arrival of the antibiotics and all. Anyway, they decided, and you can, you can really see this, psychiatry decided to tell a story in 1980. These are brain illnesses, therefore we're real doctors, our drugs are good. And really, we, if these are illnesses, it doesn't really help to say that talk therapy is good, right? They're medical illnesses, and what do you do with medical illnesses? You, you have a drug, and who can prescribe drugs? It's psychiatrists. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, who really loved this story? pharmaceutical companies because now you're going to take all these ills that human beings that you can't get a you can't pass a drug for unhappiness okay but you can pass a drug for a medical condition called anxiety or depression so they were going to take all these ills that human beings suffer all the time is you know beyond the asylum and now they're going to make them diseases and that's going to open up the market so what happened you see that the pharmaceutical companies start paying academic psychiatrists to be their advisors, consultants, um, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, speakers, advisors, consultants. Now, and I'm talking about a lot of money. So what did the pharmaceutical thing, companies think they were doing when they were hiring these academic psychiatrists? They thought they were building markets, <laughs> in other words. What did the academic psychiatrists start thinking? I'm so brilliant. <laughs> I'm a world expert that I deserve $500,000 for going on a speaking tour or doing this research or consulting. And you know the old thing, it's hard to convince a man of anything <laughs> or a person of anything if it goes against their financial well-being. The, the actual sentiment is much more concise than that. Um, once the profession said to themselves, this is the story we're going to tell, they're going to start believing that story. And they're, and, and, and they're going to start seeing whatever bits of science that can support that story. That's what they're going to glom onto. And they're going to find a way to either ignore or discount or even keep out of their journals some of the um, stuff that challenged that. And what you see quite clearly in American psychiatric history, those psychiatrists who broke with that and wanted to publish other types of research, they got killed. By killed, I mean their 
their, their careers uh, went down the tubes. So that became a clear message that we are going from psychiatry, supported by uh, pharmaceutical money. And as Whitaker lays out in Anatomy of an Epidemic, many people find themselves in this catch-22, kind of almost Kafkaesque position, where they go to the doctor and get a certain diagnosis of maybe anxiety or depression and a prescription. They then find that the drug has serious effects, side effects, well, they're not really side effects, they're the effects of the drug. But then any of those effects of the drug, they then maybe get moved onto a different drug or a cocktail of drugs, and any of the effects of the drug are then often attributed to their initial diagnosis, their initial condition. So very rarely are the side effects or the effects linked to the drugs themselves. Can you talk about that sort of catch-22 situation that people find themselves in and how that plays out, just in a sort of a bigger picture? Well, in a way, I think you've summarized it quite good. <laughs> it's quite well. Um, that's exactly right. So what happens is, uh, so you, you start down this path, okay? And often you, you get down this path with just a mild problem, right? You come in, you have a mild problem, you're looking for, maybe you got divorced or you lost a job or something has happened, okay? Maybe you're not sleeping. And so you start down this path where your brain is going to be changed by the drug. And as we were discussing earlier, very often it poops out. The positive effect, the sort of control of the symptoms, poops out over time, right? So what happens when it poops out? Do you blame, and, and, and maybe new symptoms are coming up, right? Oh, I wasn't depressed before, but now I'm depressed. Right? I wasn't anxious before, now I'm anxious. The proper medical thing would be to say, ah, the drug has stopped working, and maybe... It's in, indeed inducing those problems. That's the iatrogenic damage. But people who prescribe drugs don't want to admit that their drugs are doing harm. They only want to see them through a prism of doing help. Even though we all know that drugs can do harm, that's not how the prescriber or the, uh, you know, the medical profession of psychiatry wants to see its drugs. So what they do is, is they start saying that um, uh, people are treatment resistant. Or, you know, it's the illness that is, is what you're seeing now is the illness return. And once that happens, what happens? You go on a second drug, you go on a third drug, you go on a fourth drug. Now, if you start on one and end up on four drugs, uh, that's a sign of medical failure, right? I mean, you, you, no one says polypharmacy is good. And what it means is you've, you've started having new symptoms. And so you're moving to new symptoms, new dysfunction. And once you get on four or five drugs, boy, I mean, it's hard to function well on four or five drugs. And you can't imagine the number of stories that, I mean, you can, but there's so many stories like, I went on, just the other night, I met, a, I, I, was in, I was talking to someone who, it, in their sophomore year of college, um, they broke up with their girlfriend, and as a result, failed chemistry. <laughs> so he was put on the benzo was anxious. 32 years later, he was trying to taper from the benzo. He wasn't working. He'd been on any, any number of drugs. It all started when he broke up with his girlfriend, like when he was 20 years old. But <clears throat> that's part of the um, narrative that really is a uh, misleads the public with that when people, when you see people deteriorate on these medications long-term, it's blamed to the disease, even though there's no evidence that this is the natural course of things. And in that way, they, they, preserve, they preserve the image of the drugs as, 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 you know, as helpful and all the problems get assigned to the disease, but there's no evidence for that. And, 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 and David, one thing I think that's really important here, what's the natural course of these problems? Because in order to assess whether a drug is doing harm over the long term, okay, or providing a benefit, you have to know the natural course. What is the natural capacity to recover? And so what is the long-term course? Your drug, in order to be beneficial, has to beat that natural recovery rate. So let's say the natural recovery rate from depression is 80%, which by the way is what it used to be called. And, and, and that two years later, let's say, 80% are not depressed, okay? For your drug to be beneficial over two years, you have to have a recovery rate of like 85%. And, but you don't see that. You'll see like, well, actually, the recovery rate on antidepressants is terrible. But 
in the best long in a in a couple long term studies we had in the United States, you know what stay well rate was at the end of one year in real clinical settings. In one, it was three percent, and and the other was about uh, I think it was about six percent. And as the the researchers said, these are astonishingly low, uh, you know, stay well rates. And when they did those studies, they said. These are real world studies. We're not going to be doing these pharma funded studies where you're, you're trying to pick a select group of people. Now, at the same time, but anyway, so what are you doing? You're taking the natural recovery rate and you're lowering it. This was always one of my puzzles with Jordan Peterson's philosophy and worldview is because he was so critical of the new atheists, their sort of reductionistic and materialistic view of the world and how it left no space for the soul. This is why I have such frustration, say, with people like Sam Harris, the sort of radical atheists, because they seem to think that once human beings abandon their, their grounding in the transcendent, that the, the plausible way forward is with a kind of purist rationality that automatically attributes to other people equivalent value. It's like, I just don't understand that. But I never saw him draw that kind of obvious next step, which is, what kind of world does that worldview or that philosophy create? The reduction of the world to only what you can measure and quantify and the reduction of the human being to only the chemicals and the processes. And this area of psychiatric drug, psychiatric intervention is one of the most obvious examples of where that philosophy is lacking. I don't think we understand the psyche at all, as Robert explains. It starts from a, a sort of mechanistic view of human beings, right? And, and, and of course, medicine did advance in many ways from a mechanistic point of view. You know, you understood the heart and these sort of things. At the same time, I think medicine as a whole has faltered for that <laughs> because they're not seeing that these holistic, you know, these, we're not just a heart, we're not just this system, we're not just that system, that all these things are interrelated. I mean, we're talking physically now, right? I'm not even getting in so much into the brain. Um, but now add in the brain, and now add in consciousness. And now and this unbelievable ability to feel and know the world and, and know a little bit about your mind, at least the conscious part. I think if you go through human history, right, that we, we can, and, and people are societies are trying to understand themselves and they tell stories about like how we got here and what is our relationship to nature and what is the mind and God and all. There's a mystery to it. There's a profundity to it. So we often saw Jordan Peterson defending the current system and in some ways defending the status quo for obvious and justified reasons. Uh, the Western tradition of free speech uh, the necessity of hierarchies of competence, the sheer unlikeliness of having a functioning civilization at all, and gratitude for that. But we didn't often see him point out the corrupting influences on the system or the drawbacks of the current system, and in some ways the increasing dysfunctionality of that system. So the first film that really put Rebel Wisdom on the map was Glitch in the Matrix, Jordan Peterson, the mainstream media, and the intellectual dark web. The follow-up to that was called Glitch in the Matrix 2, and was called The Origin Story of the Intellectual Dark Web with Eric Weinstein, the man who came up with the term. And in that, he looked really carefully at the structure of institutions, how groupthink arrives, how consensus is built around false narratives, and the damage that that's done to society. So in general, when I hear the word consensus, my initial hit on the word consensus is negative. Why is that? It's because if everybody agrees that something is true, like 2 plus 3 equals 5, you don't need a consensus. Nobody talks about the arithmetic consensus. Everybody who doesn't subscribe to the arithmetic consensus uh, goes nowhere. They can't build a house. They, they can't, uh, you know, handle money. Okay, so there is no need to call it the arithmetic consensus. On the other hand, um, if things are actually open-ended, very rare for people to all bunch together around one set of tentative ideas. So what you find is that in general, you would expect a cacophony of people, each with their own pet ideas when things are genuinely uncertain, or you would find everybody falling in line when more or less it's clear that uh, 
that the world goes one particular way. So in general, I think what's going on with a consensus is that a consensus is usually achieved through some sort of incentivizing people, as the, uh, as the mobs, uh, the violent mobs in Mexico say, plato o plomo, do you want silver or do you want lead? So you're given a certain amount of encouragement to come to a particular perspective, maybe in terms of grant money or speaking opportunities, and you're given a disincentive, which is this is what's going to happen to your career if you don't fall in line. And he also coined the term, the distributed information suppression complex, or the DISC, to talk about how inconvenient narratives were kept out of the conversation. Do you want to talk a little bit about what the DISC is and why you think it's so important? Sure. If you went back to the first Matrix movie, let's say, uh, clearly it's a sci-fi thriller. But you have to ask yourself, was it fiction at all? Is the reason that that movie did so well and played so well that in fact it wasn't fiction but metaphor? And I think that there's some point uh, in which Morpheus starts describing the Matrix in the film as a prison that you cannot see, taste, feel, or touch, or something like that. In some sense, the disc works like this. We've lived our entire lives in a medium, and that medium has to do with the way in which our ideas are suppressed. Long story short is that there were a lot of storytelling influences that made it difficult for critics, and there was a lot of money and power and prestige behind the uh, conventional narrative. Yeah, it's, I find it really interesting. We, there's another uh, person we've had on the channel quite a bit called Eric Weinstein, yeah. who talks about the, he, he, he's called, so he's come up with a term, the DISC, the Distributed Information Suppression Complex. And oh, I think it, great. yeah, I think it fits perfectly with this. He, he basically describes how in many different areas of um, many different institutions, they coalesce around certain narratives for prestige and financial and other kind of incentive structures. And then anyone who deviates from that is like taken out. He calls it the platter of plomo. So you're either bought off or you're dispatched. It comes from the, I think, uh, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Escobar used yeah. to kind of keep people in line in Medellin in Colombia by either bribery or, or assassination. And he, he talks about this in, I think this is the, one of the, the most obvious examples of how that system works that I've, that I've seen. Yeah, I, I, that's uh, exactly what happened. That's a brilliant way of summarizing. Yeah. And you know and, what's brilliant about this is you can see the incentives. I mean, and you can see who benefits from this. So you can see why you, you would have this sort of uh, you know, thing in operation. That's a brilliant, I, I, love, I love that sort of acronym too. That's a great acronym. What, what drives you in this, in this work? What, why, why are you sort of plowing this furrow? And have you felt it a bit of a lonely battle over the years? Um, there are elements of loneliness. That's for sure. There are also uh, elements of great reward. And the reward comes from um, this counter-narrative. Let's call it a counter-narrative that I've been talking about. It's, it's getting more and more accepted. <laughs> it's growing, okay? And it's making inroads even into, you know, journals and that sort of thing, psychiatric journals. So there is some reward uh, for pursuing a counter-narrative that even as time goes by, gets stronger, not weaker. Like new evidence just continues to come along that supports your the counter narrative and, the, and, and revealing the falseness of the, you know, of the conventional narrative. So there's something rewarding about that. I've had so many, 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 many people write me and say, ah, now I understand my life. I got, I got screwed up on these drugs. Uh, and, and many now, so often it's hard to get off these drugs, okay? But I know many people who have and they feel like they got their lives back. And of course, it's rewarding to be part of a, an underdog bot battle, right? David versus Goliath. That's always fun. That said, it's tough. Because you get excommunicated. People think you're a little nutty or something. How could you, how could you, be, the, how, how could you be the one that understands things better? You know, how can your narrative be better than uh, 
the narrative put together by the American Psychiatric Association. And I say, well, it's not my narrative. It's actually their narrative. It's their science, it's not my science. What's wearing though? Okay, so, and I, by the way, David, you meet so many great people, in, engaged human people, humanistic people. You also have the joy of, you know, in journalism, the old adage of like, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And here you feel so often you're comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. And that's pretty great. And as Robert said, one of the reasons that this is not talked about so much in the media is that we're dealing with vulnerable people in difficult situations and no editor wants to put the message out there that says everyone should stop taking their drugs. Uh, and it's important to say that the drugs have very good effect in the short term in acute conditions. And I also feel a certain sense of responsibility to point to some things that do seem to work. One of the most promising interventions when I was looking into this a couple of years ago was something called Open Dialogue, which is an intervention where a number of therapists and the family of the person who's suffering come together and talk about what's going on and set up some kind of support systems for the person in trouble. This was doing really well in some of the Nordic countries and in Germany, and they were even looking at it for a trial in the UK and the NHS. I think the thing that struck many of us during Jordan Peterson's kind of meteoric rise to fame was this sense of intimacy and connection with his audience. In some ways, he was like a perfect YouTube star in that way. You got a real sense, he was very open about what was going on, you got to see his, inside his life in many ways. And also, he had a real level of self-awareness, like he was constantly inquiring and asking questions about what was happening to him, and was aware enough of how the process was affecting him in negative ways as well. It's not like the media exposure Although it's been stressful, it's not like I'm not grateful for it. Even people who've put me on the spot very badly have ended up doing me a tremendous favor. But the problem is, is that because... The problem is I'm becoming too much on guard and, and I, I've noticed a, a developing sense of impatience um, within me and some suspicion and that's not good. I don't want to be in situations where those are my fundamental orientations. It's, it, it's, a, it's a sign of a certain amount of internal corruption on my part. So hopefully Jordan Peterson has turned a corner in his recovery and will continue to get better. And I'd love to have a conversation with him sometime soon and ask him, given that he has ended up in this position just by following doctor's orders, just by doing what he was advised to do, whether it's given him any new thoughts or insights into the wider problems with the system, the wider corruptions with the system, and the systemic meta-crisis that's caused by this very reductionistic worldview. So, take care, see you soon. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon. <laughs>